We'll start this video off with a disruption. All right. Hey guys. So, hmm. All right, I'm gonna give you all a few minutes to jump on. I am talking to you today about being a distractible, multitasking farmer and trying to fit all that in and cheese making and how you make cream cheese by sort of accidentally being that distractible, multitasking farmer. And then also we're gonna talk a little bit about ferments and how you can do that really um, easily and how you can help support your gut health with fermented foods. Um, it's not as crazy as it sounds and you guys have actually probably all eaten some fermented foods. You just maybe didn't realize what it was or what it meant to be fermented. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Um, let me know when you guys hop on and um, we will uh, get going. I'm just going to give you guys a couple minutes and um, get my little music going. By the way, um, personal favorite playlist is um, it's called Hand Clapping and Foot Stomping on Google Play. Check it out. Totally like today's Americana, fun jams, like awesome, great for like everything that you do. So hey, um, let me know when you guys jump on. I see a couple people hopping on. Just let me know who's here. Um, and we'll get going. We're going to talk about cheese making and fermented foods and all kinds of fun hippie farmer April things because uh, this is my life. Do you see the bacon in the background of the salami? Yeah. Oh, quick fun story about the salami. Like, let me get it. So, this is our personal salami. We made this um, this January. We cured salami. Thank you to our good friend Adam and Lisa. Um, we butchered a pig on our, and the bacon, they helped us do that too. Uh, we butchered a pig on our farm, took it to their farm, it's about 20 minutes away or so, processed it, and we wanted to cure it all, like make bacon and salami and all these different crazy charcuterie stuff. It's actually a pretty simple process, um, and it doesn't require refrigeration. Cool. Um, so I have a whole pig downstairs in my root cellar, like aging, which is awesome. Um, I totally wasn't going to talk about this, but since it's hanging in the background, I didn't think about it. I'm going to share with you guys a fun story. So, um, we did this pig in like January. We hung it up. We put it, we do all the aging things you do for the first few days or curing and then aging. And you have to kind of manage your, um, environment. You have to keep it like a nice, kind of fairly steady temperature. You have a decent range. And then the humidity, you want, don't want it to be too dry. You don't want it to be too humid in your aging space or you get, you know, inadequate um, conditions for your pig to, for your pork to um, become salami and charcuterie. So we set up our little root cellar. It was in pretty decent shape, pretty decent conditions for it. We just needed to modify it a little, but quickly our salami like really hardened. So it was just dry and it wasn't tasty. Um, the first couple pieces we pulled down were, but it just dried too quickly. So we um, kind of gave up on it. Um, we were like, oh, well, we'll figure out what we're going to do with that salami at some point. Well, just yesterday, we actually had some uh, other new farmers because people ask us questions about farming. Weird, because we're totally new and don't know what the hell we're doing, but we're enthusiastic and uh, like to share. <laughs> so um, these newer farmers came out and they were like checking out our place and kind of what we're doing. And we showed them the root cellar and we were talking about curing pork. And um, we happened to see, um, um, happened to see that you know, maybe we'll just check the salami. Let's just see what it looks like. Well, let me tell you, this stuff was like, it was nasty looking, okay? White mold is good, all right? White mold is good on your charcuterie, but black mold and yellow mold and gray mold and blue mold and all these other crazy colors of mold, not so great. But um, just because you get that on the outside doesn't mean that it's bad, apparently. So I was like prepared to throw this out. Actually, I did throw a um, whole piece, like it's a small piece of a meat um, like a whole muscle, Lonzino, um, out in the yard. And then Adam texted me back and was like, oh, clean it off. Use some apple cider vinegar and wash it, hang it, let it dry. And now, um, that is like the most delicious Lonzino I've ever had in my life. Um, I've had a couple and that's been down there aging for, since like January. And usually you eat that only a couple weeks in. So it was a really yummy Lonzino, um, because we cleaned it off, hung it up, let it dry a little bit. And there's no black mold into the meat, so we were actually able to enjoy it. So we inadvertently, well not inadvertently, sort of in spite of our inadequacies as new farmers who like to do too many things at once, 
made some pretty yummy charcuterie. Watch out. So um, that will be here. So next time you're visiting us at Gaia Farm, uh, totally ask us to cut some uh, charcuterie. We'll try to keep some handy so you guys can try it. So we did this, we also did the salami. And so today we're actually gonna cut this um, this afternoon probably and have that with dinner maybe. Um, so yeah, you can totally do that. And so charcuterie is actually kind of a form of fer fermentation. Like when you do salami, you have to add some culture to it. We use kefir and then some seasoning and some celery and all these great things. And um, we, um, and then you ferment it like in your house, like in near the wood stove or, you know, whatever your heat source for a couple of days. And then you pack it into the casings, which in our case was actual pig intestines because that's a natural casing, not some synthetic stuff. And it was all like off the farm. Um, and then you hang it to dry and that's it. And um, similar concept with meats. So anyway, um, that was a little mini crash course and um, you guys will totally want to taste some of the salami and the charcuterie when you come visit us. But what I was gonna tell you was another example of our slightly distracted, multitasking, ambitious, overly ambitious, um, get ourselves into things too deep farming techniques is cheese making because I just said we need a dairy cow. Darn it, we're gonna buy a dairy cow. So now we have tons of milk um, and uh, we drink milk, but our dairy cow, Lena, is so awesome and she gives us way more milk than we can ever drink every single day. And you can't keep milk in your fridge for like ever, so you have to do something else with it. So we make ice cream and we also make cheese. Um, not to the stage of like doing dried aged cheese yet, maybe that'll be this next fall, I think, but for right now we're doing a lot of like fresh soft cheeses that'll keep in the fridge for a couple of weeks. And so yesterday I was making cheese because we had like, I don't know, two and a half, three gallons of milk that I needed to do something with. And um, I made mozzarella, a quick win, took a little bit, put it in the fridge, it's done. And then I was like, whenever this happened, happen chance, that this Lonzino, this cured <laughs> whole meat pork muscle that we um, salvaged um, was actually good. My friend Adam suggested that we um, make cream cheese and shave that Lonzino really thin and put it on toast and that it would be amazing like lox and cream cheese, right? So um, I made cream cheese. I was like, thank you, you just decided what other kind of cheese I'm gonna make with the other gallon of milk I had. Hey guys, let me know who's here and like tuned in because I would love to see, oh, Dave wants salami. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, come back and visit us, Dave. Um, so I made cream cheese because I was like, yeah, I want lox and toast with my like pork charcuterie that we all off our farm. I love that, like eating on the farm food, right? So I made cream cheese, but let me tell you how I made cream cheese. I got the milk out and I put it on the counter and I left it sitting on the counter while I did other things around the farm, tried to pick berries toward these new farmer friends around, you know, all that stuff, had a beer. And um, I came back and I was like, oh crap, I have to make cream cheese. So I put it in the pot. The pot was still warm from the mozzarella cheese, thankfully. And I, and you don't have to heat cream cheese very high, right? It's like um, 75 degrees or something like that. To culture your, or warm your milk to like 75 degrees. And so I was like, let me just check what temperature my milk is at before I start heating it. That's a good practice. As an or as a newbie cheese maker, it's a new it's a good practice to know what temperature you're starting at, okay? Q, Q number one. Um, so I checked it and it was like at 75 degrees. So my milk sat on the counter for like three hours um, and was already warm to where I needed it because hello, we live in West Virginia in an old cabin, we do not have central air, okay? Um, so 75 degrees, my milk inadvertently got itself to the temperature that I needed it. And so I just had to add my culture, which was a little bit of a mesophilic culture, um, and then the rennet, and um, stir it up and then let it sit. And that was it. I let it sit for like 14 to 16 hours. You don't mess with it. And then I strain it off and use like a butter muslin or cheesecloth to um, put the cheese, the like cheese curds, it's not really curds for um, cream cheese, but the cheese into to then strain so that more of the um, liquid uh, pours off. So like this, it kind of makes like a ball and I hang it from actually this thing, which is totally a fruit basket for bananas and it drips into a bowl. So then I did that like till just a little bit ago and now I have cream cheese uh, pretty passively, which is awesome. It's like my favorite type of farm project, something that I have to do very minimal with and provides me awesome things. Now, um, it's not super sweet, so I actually added just like a tablespoon of honey maybe. What's up, Spence? Mm -hmm. Okay, if I turn to you, just turn it down though. Uh, yeah, you can do that, that's fine. For a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, cream cheese, 
passively by a distractible, multitasking, overambitious <sighs> hippie farmer April. Okay, so there you go. You're welcome. Cream cheese, and now I'm totally excited to do some locks um, and do um, like my pork charcuterie cream cheese on toast. So now, on to the bones of the class crash course today um, is fermentation. Are you all familiar with fermentation? Have you had things that are fermented, maybe like sauerkraut or kimchi or any veggies? Salami, like I said, is fermented. I don't know. So you guys let me know there if you've had any fermented food, okay? Cheese is actually kind of fermented. If you add a culture at a certain temperature, it's a little more compli complicated than some things. But we make a lot of fermented foods here, especially in the summer because you get like a crazy bounty of, um, cro of produce and you can't freeze all of it. Um, you can't eat it all fresh and I don't want it to go to waste. Yes, my pigs will eat it and that makes bacon, yay. But I would like to have some stuff like, I don't know, maybe I want some eggplant in November. What do I, how do I do that? Because frozen eggplant does not make very good eggplant, okay? So how you do that is you chunk up your eggplant and you put it in a salt brine and you um, put it on your counter sealed with your glass jar lid and you let it sit and it ferments. And then it makes delicious baba ganoush, you guys. Like, delicious. No kidding. So um, what we're going to do today is actually called dilly beans. So if you have beans are totally in season, right? Green beans. Um, these are some string beans we got from one of our other farmer friends because I told you guys we we're overly ambitious and we get ourselves in over our heads. Our garden is like crap, okay? Big garden space, lots of perennial stuff that I'm picking, but not much went in the ground for us to harvest later because I can only do so many things. So um, one of our farmer friends though is growing some green beans. So these are like yummy string beans. And so a simple, easy step to ferment things. Um, rinse them off, you know, like you don't want to get like too crazy with it, but I have them rinsed. Okay, and so then they're sitting over here on the towel ready for me. And then you need like a quart jar, right? And so what I've done is already put, do you wanna hear all the special ingredients you need to ferment things? You need water, salt. If you have it, some whey from milk or some of the brine from a past ferment to help kickstart it, but not necessary. You can totally just do it with salt. Whatever seasonings you want to flavor your produce with and your produce, glass jars. You all have glass jars, right? I hope so. Everybody needs glass jars. Okay, so that's all you need. All right, so salt, maybe a Kickstarter with some whey or previous salt brine culture um, from a previous ferment, and your seasonings, your produce, and glass jars and lids, okay? So what I've done is just put on my two tablespoons of um, salt, and I like the like Himalayan, like pink, you know, sea salt, like nice, lots of minerals. Um, and I put just a little bit of water in there to kind of help absorb it a little bit. And I added um, some dill weed. Now, we do have fresh dill somewhere on this farm, but I'm pretty sure my husband cut it all back on accident when he was trying to make some headway in the garden, which is a mess aforementioned, right? So um, I just added some dry dill because I want them to be dilly beans. My little kids love dilly beans. So that literally, this makes the easiest, um, the, the easiest snack, the easiest side to dinner or lunch. Um, or breakfast if you want um, in the summer or the fall or whenever because you do just pull them out and it's easy to it's easy like super easy I love eating um, eating our ferments with our like meals and you don't need a lot so really cool so, so a couple tablespoons of salt and a little bit of water to kind of dissolve it and then my um, dill is what I added here um, to um, you know start dissolving the salt a little bit and then my beans that are rinsed I'm gonna like pack them I'm gonna hold this up so I can show you guys I'm just gonna like pack them in here the best I can. It's kind of imperfect, they're tall. I just realized I forgot something else that I need. Not necessary, but a big bonus. Um, so I'll get it in a second, show you guys. So pack these down in here, as tight as you can get them. You don't want a lot of room. I dropped one on the floor, sorry. Hey Crystal, hey guys, so have you all tried fermented foods before while I do this? I wanna hear like what kind of things have you fermented? Um, I'm just gonna pack the green beans down here in my mason jar. This is like the simplest thing ever. My five-year-old can make ferments. He does actually, so pretty sure you can do it. <laughs> Go to your farmer's market and get some things. What kind of fermented foods have you guys tried? Tell me, I wanna hear. Or have you never? Are you scared? I hope you're not scared because it's delicious and really good for you. Y'all know when I started fermenting food was when we lived in Okinawa, Japan, and I had nobody to show me how to do it. I didn't speak Japanese, so I wasn't like I could go ask a bunch of like the Japanese people who make some delicious fermented food, like fresh tofu, by the way,